like to introduce our speaker. Henry Crowder is a life forever changed in 1985 when an older Parisian woman asked, are you American? Henry spoke to her in French, assured her that he was indeed American, and tears formed in her eyes. Merci, she told him. I'm not sure of my French pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> I was just in Ireland, you know, I'm not here. see that. Thank you for what you Americans, thank you for what you Americans did to save us from near starvation and the oppression of the Nazis. I will never forget that. After a tour through her neighborhood, where she showed him bullet holes in buildings and recalled military executions of her Parisian neighbors and friends, Henry began reading about World War II. Now, more than six decades after the post-Normandy liberation of Paris, Henry will share what he learned. He runs a local intellectual salon and is always looking for guests, uh, guests and engaging speakers. He also works as a wellness and fitness coach, a professional speaker, and is the author of two books, uh, Sedentary Nation and The Aging Athlete. Uh, the Aging Athlete will be available uh, for sale afterwards at, uh, by the front door, uh, along with two of his DVDs, The Business Traveler's Workout and The Lake Geneva Workout. So please join me in welcoming Henry Croyer. Merci. J'ai besoin d'un peu d'aide. I need a little help. How many people were in high school choir in this room? Okay, if you would stand up and lead the people with you, we're just going to do one little bit. Please stand up and join me. <laughs> the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land and of the free and the home of the And for those who remember this one, aux armes citoyens, formez vos bataillons, marchons, marchons, consent impur, abreuve un océan. Woo! A little French lesson before we get going. Répétez après moi les débarquements. Le général, Leclerc. Le, général Leclerc. Le général Eisenhower. Le général Eisenhower. Le général Patton. Le général Rommel. Le général La résistance. L'admiral La Ramsey. Ramsey. Les maquisards. Les, Les bateaux Higgins. Operation Neptune et Operation Overlord. We did it. The French lesson is over. Congratulations. <laughs> How do you put a world war into context? Especially if you were to talk to someone who's 12 or 15 that's been inundated for many years learning all the subjects in school from Ben Franklin to the Romans, and now all the world wars, and then they have these AP tests. How do you put this thing into context? Well, I say that it's a world war. Start with that, and start with that your parents, your older siblings were very involved in it, and you might have been collecting things like things made out of metal for the war effort. So that puts things in the context immediately. 3% of the world population died in World War II. Can you? <laughs> Can you imagine that? 3%, it hits me right here. If you add up World War I and World War II, 100 million people lost their lives in this incredible worldwide event, cataclysmic event. So da 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 is the sign for victory. So everyone repeat with me, Beethoven's fifth. Da 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 da. And here we have a sailor, we're in the maritime location. And that's his job, is to do what it takes to get this war accomplished for the good guys, the allies in this case. 
Bienvenue à la forteresse d'Europe. There's a little bit of show, social history. What happened to the regular people during this thing? This is the schedule for tonight, le plan. Operation Overlord, with a little bit of the maritime component. A PF performance up on le balcon by a diva and a don. Paris brûle-t-il, is Paris burning, Brent Paris. Another little performance, Q&A from you. And then la fin, and we can all stand up and take a bow because I expect every one of you to participate. The heart is where this hit me, not the political history. This older woman who came up there and shared her story and thanked me. I, I'm getting teary thinking about this 30 years later. Thank me for things that my ancestors and people, uh, other Americans, you know, people in, in the, in from you know, Alameda to New York, from, from Tampa to San Diego, and all parts in between, sacrificed years of their lives and their lives for this woman. So it's a human interest story, and so that's especially captivating for me. And what did I do? Well, I started with the book, Is Paris Burning? After getting a degree in history and in French, and, and my BAs are in those, but I started reading with this book, Is Paris Burning? And it was so well written. Five years it took these two journalists who wrote the book to come up with the, the research and to put this all together. Knowing about World War II over the years has made many an evening more interesting. Think of yourself at a cafe. Next to you is someone you don't know. You ask them something about the weather, about other restaurants in the area, what's happening tomorrow. Pretty soon you run out of things to say. Over the course of my life from 1985 till now, if I brought up World War II, I had between a two minute and a 20 minute conversation. And some people I met through that became friends for decades. So that's what I, I, I did with this lovely subject for me, World War II. Now, if you're thinking about religion or politics in a conversation, those are two things that can build, develop angst. Am I correct? Yeah. So I'm a provocateur of thought. I do not sit very often as a wallflower unless I'm sort of analyzing, you know, seeing how people do. I'm interested. I'm a writer and I'm a philosopher. But I'm a pro provocateur of thought. I want to see what makes people tick. So here I was, pre-gray, back in the day, 1985, at the Saint-Germain bus stop in Paris. And of course, it's cold. I've got the foulard rouge, the red scarf around my neck. I'm dressed like Inspector Clouseau. <laughs> and I'm looking at the map. So what I wrote down here up top is the first thing that uh, struck me about France. People talk about the Germans. Sie müssen der Regeln folgen. You must follow the rules. But in France, on doit suivre les règles. They are just the sticklers for following civic laws and rules in school, uh, the church rules, everything. They are as sticklers as the Germans. And so I was kind of a, a free spirit from a farm in New Jersey at the time. So I had to wake up real quick in order to adapt. Can anyone in here tell me, qu'est-ce qui s'est passé on June 4th, 1940? Four years before Normandy. The escape, right? The German invaded and the French escaped. What town? Dunkirk. Dunkirk, correct. The Allied retreat at Dunkirk. Amazingly enough, the Germans allowed several hundred thousand people to escape. And how did they escape? By boats. People like you that came from England, came from the, the Isle of Jersey, and uh, left France. And they took them on whatever boats that they had, and they allowed them to escape. And the speech, I'm going to grab my list here. So this is what Churchill said. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the fields. We shall fight in the air. We shall fight everywhere. We shall never give up. And that's what happened. England did not give up. France did not give up. And America got jump-started a little bit late. But they were providing food, armaments, planes, pilots, etc., cetera, uh, to England at the time. So this story that starts at boats is rekindled with boats. It ends with a boatload of reverie. So here's a map of the Channel Islands and all the way up to England, Gold Beach, Juno Beach, Sword Beach, and Omaha Beach, which was the disaster. Omaha Beach, yeah. And on their way to Paris, two months of heavy battles with the Germans who were well equipped, much more experienced than most of the uh, infantry people that came here, but they had to contend with the American Air Force, which was the toughest part for them. And then there was a French town. Let's not forget the, the French fighting to liberate themselves. There's a town called Vernon, 
that liberated itself, and there are other little towns too, that liberated themselves from the Nazis with very antiquated weaponry. So let's not forget also that the Germans neti pa bet, that means they were not uh, idiots. And so what do we have here in this picture? Can anyone tell me? Yeah, this is a bunker, which would be called a four-star bunker. Had anybody ever seen anything like this before? Have you seen this picture? I've been studying this for 30 years, and I landed on this about a month ago. I said, boy, oh boy, look at this. It looks just like a house. It has faux fenêtre painted on the blockhouse. And so this thing would have been loaded with, with heavy artillery up here, machine guns, et cetera, watching the coast. Thousands of these blockhouses were built, and they're still there. A million French workers were enslaved to build these things to defend their country from people coming to save them. How ironic. So here's the Nazis in their, in their heyday in Paris, the, the lesser uh, officers saluting the officers in a cafe. You remember the hats from the 1940s. So very stylish. Paris was the best place, or one of the best places, you could be sent in uh, the time of World War II because you had the Vichy government working with the Nazis. There were no bombing uh, any, anywhere. And you could come here and listen to Edith Piaf and Maurice Chevalier entertaining you. And food was scarce unless you were a German or Edith Piaf probably got nice, nice uh, meals after her, her songs. And we'll talk about Edith a little bit later halfway through. It's a sad time though because what's happening is the French people are resisting, especially the young people. High testosterone, these young men want to go out and prove a point. And so what they do is they go out and they create disturbances. Just like a prisoner's job is to escape, these young people's job is to use sabotage and to mess up the Germans' game plan. And any German taking advantage of the French women, these young people were going around and, and, and grabbing them in dark alleys. And so what the Germans would do is they would grab people, and it wouldn't necessarily be the person who committed the crime, it would be anyone, and say, we're gonna line you up as an example. Sometimes they would get beat up. Sometimes if they thought they knew something, they would get put into a uh, detention center and tortured, and these poor people would hear their cousins, their neighbors, their sons, and sometimes their daughters and their wives getting tortured by the Gestapo overnight. And that, that was the, probably the most challenging thing. I mean, better off dead, for some, some occasions than being tortured repeatedly for months or being shipped away to the concentration camps. So here are the French again, 1944, being ingenieur, resourceful. So machine gun and a woman laying down the wire, the trip wire, to explode this train to uh, create disturbances so that the Germans could not move materiel of war and themselves around and stop the Allied uh, invasion. So here's how the announcement went to set off the Normandy invasion. You had radios uh, in cachette, which means in hiding, all over France, and you had the Germans jamming the radio stations. So oftentimes the radios would sound like Ici Londres, l'annonce attendue par tous. Even the Germans were listening to this, waiting for this poem by Verlaine. Les sanglots longs, des violons de l'automne, bless mon cœur d'une longueur monotone. And that announced that 20, within 24 hours, the Normandy in, of invasion would begin. So that set the resistance in motion, and that set the people in motion to get out of the places that were close to the coast. 3,000 people didn't get far enough away and they were killed by the bombardment from the airplanes and the ships, 3,000 French citizens. So here we have Le Bateau Higgins, the landing craft. How many of you would like to have one of these for the parade of lights at Christmas time? <laughs> Summer solstice? Summer solstice? So 39, 36 people could fit. They were 36 feet long with a full crew. They went nine knots could carry 18,000 pounds of materiel. What I got from studying Normandy here, because Greg Gorga said, hey, we can't just have his Paris burning, we need the maritime component. I said, well, I was a big fan of Gilligan's Island growing up, can I bring that in? <laughs> Actually, the uh, professor in Gilligan's Island was a World War II vet. So if you find people uh, around that time in the 60s, many of them were, they were born in the 20s. 
So the encampments, the factories, the trains, the ships, the harbors, the airstrips, the flight routes, and soon the beaches, one description seems to fit all of that. And that was Sete Peuple, which means it was very crowded. Everywhere you went, if you look at the encampments in England, three million people in the Allies, mostly American, young men, age 20 on the average, in these tents for six months, getting rained on in England and practicing whatever they could, and losing money in gambling. So you've seen that in all the movies, especially The Longest Day. You can see that one guy who wins all the money, and then he wants to give it back because he thinks it's a bad omen to have all this money. So the Bateau Higgins, uh, Hitler said that was the turning point that allowed, because uh, he saw these in Italy, saw, he saw these in other places, and he said that's the turning point of World War II. We couldn't stop. There were 20,000 of these bateaux made. So what was the special advantage of this front trap door that came down? Somebody raise your hand and tell me. It's convenient, you can, get, you can get off quickly, okay? What was the disadvantage of this coming into the... Single point of fire. Single point of fire. So the Germans had these machine guns that were so lightning fast, unfortunately the American technology wasn't up to speed at that time, and the Germans could just aim there, and they're shooting down, so they're not losing velocity, and they can just mow these poor people down. And so. Uh, if you jumped over the side, and, uh, and you, these people don't sh showing, they didn't show them with a big pack. Some of these packs were 80 pounds, and the poor people who didn't make it into the beach jumped off, and they drowned immediately because they couldn't get out of their pack, the, the old time pack. The test that they did in the documentaries you'll see today, people today, it takes them 40 seconds to a minute to get out of these things. So 80 pounds, you go down, and most of them drowned if they fell into the water with those 80 pounds on. So some did make it to the beach. So for those who did make it to the beach and went inland, this is another recurrent theme I found in my studies. For once in my life, I have someone who needs me. So I mentioned those people from Alameda to Tampa to uh, Trenton, New Jersey, wherever they were. The Great Depression and the high unemployment caused a loss of faith for many people, especially the young men. And the young women couldn't run away and get married because these young men didn't have any money. They couldn't start a life with them. So it was a very sad time uh, economically. Many people sensed they were just another mouth to feed. The 1940 unemployment rate, does anyone know? 14.6%. 1945 at the end of the war? 1.9%. So everyone at the, through the war effort had a job. So the cultural zeitgeist of these young men, like this man here who's been trained on how to use this field artillery, and the spirit of the age is only les bons, we're the good guys. So let's go over and be good guys, and let's have meaning to our life. Let's go save Europe from the Nazi oppression. And so the people who embarked on that crusade, these soldiers in the 6th Infantry that made it across, storming Omaha Beach, waiting for the evacuation because they got blown out of the war very quickly. Look at these poor people. Shrapnel, machine guns, bombs, mines. You know, there were some four million mines uh, along the coast that, that Rommel set up and he wanted to double that, but they ran out of time. Can anyone tell me, and these people are all destined for this hospital where they, they may spend weeks or months. Can anyone tell me why these people have long hair? You, can, you think normally military people have short hair. So they look like civilians. So if they get caught up in French society, they look just like a, a French person and they can hide out. So I, I had interviewed, and I call them interviews, pa sometimes it's just a passing conversation, sometimes it's a longer interview because I'm very interested in this subject. I've met so many, uh, thankfully, so many veterans who've shared their stories and people who were involved in the war effort, people whose parents, brothers and sisters were in the war effort. So I've been asking for, for decades, wh you know, where were you in the war? And finally, at the courthouse in 2009, October 11th, my sister's birthday, I met James Reynolds, a Normandy invasion person. So when I went up to this gentleman, I said, were you a World War II veteran? He looked like the right age, and he says, turned to me and he says, yes, I was. And I could tell something big was coming next because he said it. Like, it really meant something to him. And I said, when did you go in? 
and I, he said the first day. And my heart started pounding, I was getting goosebumps. I said, do you mean D-Day? And, I, I, and, and he said, yes, D-Day. And I said, which wave? The first wave. And I said, what happened to you? And he said, I got all the way past the bombardment. I got onto the beach, and my good friend next to me stepped on an S mine, and these mines fly up in the air. And his friend got blown to bits, and the concussion blew this man out of the war, so ribs broken and, and other things. So as soon as he got to the beach, friend on the mine, and he was blown up, and he became a casualty. And then he went to a hospital. That he, he made it back to England. And then he made it back to his farm in Montana. And he lived there happily with good health from 1945 till 2000. And then I met him in 2009. And he said his bad health started about eight months ago, which is why he was doing a tour of California. So I was very blessed to see this man. When I first uh, landed myself on the Normandy coast, this is what it looked like. Can anyone tell me what these are? Mulberries. Mulberries. So these are uh, docking systems that were, and then in the back you see those also, docking systems made out of steel and, and concrete that were dragged across by the amphibious uh, engineers to set up docks. And the tricky part was the seas were rough. So none of these docks uh, the, uh, in the initial wave turned out to be uh, usable, but some of the subsequent waves were. But they, they couldn't uh, conquer the port of Cherbourg, which is the closest big port, which would have been able to offload all of the material of war and troops and tanks. So they had to bring these across from, uh, from England. So that was the first time I landed on the coast. And I've been out exercising in Santa Barbara uh, several mornings this last week on the beach. And we've had the June gloom in full bloom. And this is what it looked like when I was there in the summertime, which is you never know when a beach day is going to be in Normandy. It's not like Santa Barbara. So an incredible photo here. My occasion back here, you know, showing up with my beach attire uh, and golf attire completely different than these young men who are the same age as I was. And I'm forever grateful uh, in patriotic uh, re reverie to, to appreciate what these gentlemen did and all of the people who supported them. So the Morse code for victory, where did this come about? The three staccato notes and one long note of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Da, 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 da. So finally, this journalist, this news editor figured that out. And he came up with that, and that became a battle cry for all people, civilians and military, to do that. D-Day is oft considered the greatest victory in naval history, the largest amphibious assault in history. Quite an undertaking. Pages, the uh, Air Force's uh, documents, 10 pounds, over 1,000 pages of notes and preparation. Uh, Normandy invasion, uh, the, the big plan, uh, 1,200 pages, so on and on with the planning. More ordnance in one invasion, not on the one day, but in one invasion. So you add up the two months of aerial bombardment and all the, the weaponry that was fired from the ships, from the drum, bombs dropped from the planes, more ordnance than the entire war of World War I. 25,000 miles of trenches in World War I. 1914 and 1918, and in two months, there was more ordnance. So one million French uh, workers, unfortunately, had to do the hor horrible job of building the Atlantic Wall. So as a maritime component, these amphibious engineers had a very difficult job. What guard good are the troops if, the, if you can't get the troops to the battlefield? You can't dislodge the Germans. So you needed these amphibious engineers. So if the battle is a deathly challenge, how hard is it to get these people across? Incredibly challenging. 20,000 Higgins boats, LCVPs, and landing ship tanks, 1,080, produced for World War II by Higgins and licensees. So one of the questions relates to this from the trivia that I handed out on your desk. We'll go over that in a little bit. But you needed to find people who knew how to drive flat bottom boats. It's a very challenging if you've ever been out on a trip on one of the lakes and you take a houseboat out, you know how when you're driving, the whole thing slides. And if it's windy, you're constantly sliding. So you had to find people who knew what they were doing. Well, how did you do this before Craigslist? <laughs> post. You used the post. 
a, an office in Washington, D.C., sent out brochures and postcards to people like you. All of the people were in sailing and boating organizations across the United States, got a letter, they tacked it up on the wall, and people from the ages of 17 to people in their 50s who thought they'd like to participate, knew what they were doing, signed up. And then they got together and practice, which was a lot of work because you're offloading troops. So you've got 39 people, 36 people, you're offloading with all their stuff, and, uh, and you're simulating the battle as much as you could. So if you go to Cape Cod, where I've spent many a summer, it's very similar to the English Channel. Uh, you have the same waves, you have uh, the same overcast, so on Barnstable in Cape Cod, on Swansea in Wales, that's where they train for Omaha Beach. And there again, same weather, Fort Ord in Monterey Bay, and we know that they often have the same weather. Camp Stoneman in Pittsburgh, California for the Pacific Theater. Practice, practice, and more practice. Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, St. Augustine, Florida, Lake Pontchartrain in New Orleans. And then they got to try this live. North Africa, Sicily, Italy. And then on Omaha Beach, Operation Upchuck. Did anyone guess what Operation Upchuck was from your trivia? <laughs> we'll, we'll go over that in a minute, so be thinking of that. So now we're gonna take a look at the trivia. So I am gonna take out the answers here. And if you happen to have your trivia sheet here, The winner gets a free June Gloom workout from me <laughs> anytime before Sunday. Anytime before Sunday or after August 15th, le 15 août. So what was Operation Upchuck? Do I have any takers out there in the audience? We know it's not pleasant. <laughs> a lot of seasick people, but why only on Omaha? They had the same seas on Juno's sword and the other beaches, they were all scared. They didn't know that Omaha was going to be a disaster. OK, I'll fill you in. Any chefs in the audience? Raise your hand. You attempted, you chefs, to do a nice thing for these troops, but it was a royal blunder. The Navy crews decided to give the troops for headed for Omaha a pre-battle meal. It was copious, it consisted of steak, pork, chicken, sausages, should I continue? Beans, bread, bacon, eggs, ice cream, candy, mixing it in with candy, donuts, washed down with America's favorite beverage that's a stomach irritant, coffee. Caffeine's a stomach irritant, it was morale boosting, but it became the last meal for many who were contemned to face high seas with a full stomach and a full onslaught at age 20 of artillery and machine gun fire from the Germans who were firing from protected positions. We already saw the bunker. Number two, numero deux, s'il vous plaît. Why were the American landing forces of the 1st Infantry Division able to overcome the odds and eventually able to gain terrain on Omaha Beach? Not surprise, not numbers. Determination. The family feud answer says correct, number one. You're missing a real big one. You know how you give kids two choices? You don't let them choose. You can say you can clean up your room right now or you can eat your peas. Right? You give them two choices. They feel like they're in charge. So these people on Omaha only had two choices. Die or survive. Die or survive. They couldn't go. They couldn't leave. Omar Bradley saw the devastation and he thought about canceling the operation. It was so bad. But they couldn't. I mean, these people are already over there. They were trained on how to invade. They weren't trained on how to escape. So the words were no alternative, immediacy, and determination. They had to get off the killing field. Then there was the shelling of the German positions. Finally, the, the naval vessels came in with the big guns. They didn't want to fire in the initial port portions because you have rangers going up the sides of cliffs, these types of things. But when they saw everything was going down in a bad way, they said, let's fire. Let's bring our ships in, go broadside, and start firing our, land, our live guns and take out those, those 
uh, artillery positions. There was no tank up, tank backup for the Germans. Anybody know why? Hitler was asleep. Hitler took a lot of different concoctions, drugs to wake up, drugs to go to sleep. He had lots of health problems. He had Parkinson's. And he was an irate person. I say he had fight or flight. Some of us have fight or flight occasionally. It's a normal part of the human psychology. I say that Hitler had fight or flight from World War I until he died. And he was in Rostenburg headquarters, the Wolfschanze, in the Wolf's Lair, and no one, no one of his subordinates had the courage to awaken him. Numero trois on the list, number three, where did Higgins get the idea of the front ramp door for the landing craft? And I wrote down, think of copying. You know how US technology has been copied for many moons? Think of a company who's been very good at copying. And I also put down copiers on here. Who is the, who, what country, so the square footage of Montana, that is one third the population of the US, had landing craft with front trap doors before us. Small country in World War II, our arch enemies. They drank sake. That was the key. As soon as I, as soon as I mentioned alcohol, we all knew. <laughs> That's why I put down copy. You remember in the 80s how the Japanese, we could copy that, yes. True or false, in 1943 during the Vichy regime, French Admiral Darlon distrusted the British and reportedly offered a French pact with Hitler. Hitler distrusted the French and therefore chose to remain neutral. Vis-a-vis -vis this, Darlan, the Darlan offer while he attacked Russia in 1943. True or false? True. Everyone likes a winner, right? In the beginning of the war, the Vichy government made a lot of sense to many people, especially these old people from World War I. So they signed on and were the ru rulers because they knew they couldn't defeat the Germans at the time, so they, they signed on and they made appeasement. But then when the Germans started losing, well, then, then you have a different story. Think people aren't, uh, even the, own, the German people wanted to, to uh, per, the soldiers wanted to sue for peace. Number five, numero cinq. Prior to World War II, Andrew Jackson Higgins, maker of the Higgins landing craft, seems to have been selling the Higgins boats to individuals intending to smuggle illegal liquor into the United States. His company's financial troubles coincided with the end of prohibition. True, c'est vrai. There's a lot of realism in war and it gets flushed out because so much has been written on this. Here, Imagine something like this, this LST landing in Africa. Hey, Kiprop, there is a tank exiting a belly of a boat. What is this? And that's what people saw when they first came, came out, these, these landing craft boats, this giant boat, the LST, offloading a tank. This was new gadgetry at the time. Now let's not forget the women. The biggest demand for women was in labor. The new munitions factories in Wales, the largest of the factories, was in Hirwan, Glasgow, and Brigan, which alone employed 60,000 people between them, the majority of whom were women. The war effort. Everyone knows about Meryl Monroe? What, did, what was the position for women? Rosie? Rosie the Riveter. So Meryl Monroe was a Rosie the Riveter. People you know, engaged in the, in the war effort. The munitions work had turned women's hair and skin yellow. I bet you hadn't heard that from your grandparents. Well, some blondes went green because of the chemicals. But there were less men around because they're all fighting in this war. So they had to go to work every day and, and be good uh, spirited people supporting the war effort. Now I have a trivia question, a live, up close and personal. What was the largest aircraft carrier ever used from April 1st through June 5th? And still today, it's the largest aircraft carrier ever used. Proved crucial in the bombings of both Normandy and the Pas de Calais, softening up the Germans, some 200,000 sorties. You are correct, sir. Give that man a cigar and that woman a cigar. <laughs> so this is what Omaha Beach, the American Liberty ships, which are still, uh, you can still see them when you go over the Carquinez Strip up, in, uh, up by uh, Martinez. 
The Glomar Explorer. Who is the Glomar Explorer? Who was behind that? Howard Hughes, yes, and next to that, the Liberty ships. So these Liberty ships, they formed, these, these corn cobs they called them, they were scuttled. I'd be interested to know how they scuttled them, but maybe they had a trap door they could fill it with water to provide makeshift breakwater during the early days of the invasion. Here you see 13 ships. It looks like a lot more ships, but they're 13 ships, and they prohibited some of the waves from reaching inland so that the work could be done with less, uh, with less wake. So here we are in full-scale inv invasion with no German artillery firing down on these people. An occasional Luftwaffe plane find, flying through and uh, wreaking havoc, but you know the landing has to happen. But English people do one thing. I don't mean to pick on them. I'm a big fan of the English people. I lived on the Costa del Sol and my best friends there were English. The Costa del Sol in Spain is where all the people from England go for a summer holiday. It's like the San Diego or or the Florida of, uh, of England. And so these uh, harried souls, these young Englishmen, five of them, they made it all the way across. But by the time they made it across, it was 345, and someone gathered together a table, and someone gathered together a pot and some cups. And as a good English person will do, they had tea time right in the vicinity of all of this embrouillage, this traffic jam, and the Americans, and if they were from New Jersey, they went up to them and they quoted Hemingway. They said in a New Jersey accent, hey, uh, Limey's over there. You guys are having tea time. Well, like Hemingway said, you know, to have or have not. Have not. Get, get out of our way. We've got to load these things off here. <laughs> Operation Neptune, the cross-channel invasion is successful. Now the march towards, through France, and towards Germany. Was that an easy expedition? No, the Germans are darn good. And they were fighting for survival. They're going to be surrounded soon by Patton. Did Eisenhower want to attack Paris and liberate the French? No, he didn't. He did. These people were not trained in urban warfare. You've got three, three million people living in Paris. If you liberate them, there are going to be a lot of deaths to your side, their side. You're going to use gasoline all of your ammunition, and you're, you're going to have to feed these people and provide them uh, cooking, uh, fuel, all these things. You do not want to uh, land uh, near Paris. You want to go all the way to Germany and catch the Germans before winter, cross the Rhine before winter. That's the goal. Did that happen? No. no. And we're going to find out why. And now, my friends, we're going to have a little performance. Da, 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 Chante Milor. Bravo Milor. Da, 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 da. Ba, ra, 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 da, ra. Now we're going to get to Hitler and Is Paris Burning? Yodel. I demand to know Is Paris Burning? Brent Paris. And now you see the fight or flight for several decades that I was talking about. And with how did Hitler rule with an iron fist, just like Genghis Khan ruled in the Mongol conquest of the 13th century? You join us or you die. The Gestapo and the SS will come by and shoot you. And the workers, you have to work for us or the same thing. You're going to die, be tortured, or sent to a concentration camp with German eff efficacy. What subject did Hitler study in, in before he... 
Art. And so, what was the other one? Art. Art. And here he is in the city, renowned for its architecture, its beautiful art, the Louvre Museum, the Musée d'Orsay, the Musée Pompidou later on. And here he is with his architect, very interesting book. Does anyone know what famous book Albert Speer wrote? Yes, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, which is about yay thick, and I have yet to read it, but that's on my, on my list. So here he is with Albert Speer, very interesting person to, to, re, uh, to read about. He's an, a rational person, as far as I can tell, and here's a sculptor, another artist, Arno Brecher, and here they are doing the typical postcard photo that many of us have done and our parents have done in Paris. And the Germans, the master race, conquered France and to show the Parisians every day that they are in charge, besides the evening tortures and robbing people of their wealth uh, as penalties, these people, the Wehrmacht, the soldiers, not all Nazis, by the way, would parade up and down the Champs Elysees every day with a fife and drum corps. Then in 1965, a book was written, and this is the book that changed my life and got me into this, this subject. Is Paris Burning was written, as I mentioned, five years of study. 1966, famous French actor Charles Boyer, Alain Delon, Jean-Paul Belmondo, Kirk Douglas, Frank American, Glenn Ford, and playing General von Schultzitz, Gerb Frobe, who is an amazing actor. This movie was very hard to make. It's not, I would call, a tremendous movie, but if anything holds it together, it's the performance by Gerb Frobe, who plays a general in this movie. Does anyone know what he plays in The Longest Day? He's in the opening scene on a mule delivering water with all these gigantic uh, jer jerry cans clanging around and the French people are up in their little coastal home wishing him all the bad they can give him. He's bringing water to the people in the bunker. So when you watch uh, The Longest Day, you'll be able to see him. So an all-star cast, incredibly best-selling book, and the clock is ticking. That's the story of Normandy, and that's the story of Is Paris Burning? The clock is ticking. Orson Welles is also in this movie, playing Raoul Nordling, the, uh, the Swedish consul. Leslie Caron, very beautiful, is also in this movie. I, I uh, highly recommend you reading the book and taking a look at this movie. The clock is ticking. According to the book, Hitler called his chief of staff, Alfred Jodl, to follow up on the order he had previously issued when he was awake, of course. Adolf Hitler screamed, I demand to know yes or no Brent Paris but his demand for the total destruction of the world's most beautiful city was never carried out. People tell me that Praha is also equally beautiful. I've not been there, but large scale city, Paris is just exquisite. So let's take a look at what could have happened to Paris in the uh, devastation by bombs, mines, aircraft, and artillery. Here's Rotterdam before the Blitz, before the Nazis invaded. This is a middle aged this town, just gorgeous in Holland. And there's Rotterdam in 1940. Again, German eff efficacy, the same people who built Mercedes and Porsches and BMWs, Bayerische Motoren Werke, General von Schultzitz and General Goering, formerly a historic medi medieval city, is razed to the ground in very short order. Because first they burn and then the, the bombs explode everything. So let's take a look at Stalingrad, the worst war, many say, in the history of warfare is Stalingrad. All for nothing, if you look at it, it's just killing places and destroying a city, but some people define war as killing people and breaking things. General F Field Marshal von Richthofen, the cousin of the Red Baron, the famed ace of World War I, was one of the people instrumental in destroying Stalingrad, which was a battle that lasted an incredibly long time five months, one week, and one day, all the way until February of 1943, Germans versus the, so the, the Soviets at the time. So look at the devastation here. Stalingrad before, Stalingrad after, for no military purpose that I can see besides killing a lot of troops and wasting a lot of ammunition. And here's in the height of the battle, of course, getting the swastika out. And here's a very pivotal fo photo. I mean, that's that says a lot when, the, when nature and the animal kingdom has to deal with the havoc that man wreaks. Unbelievable historic photo. 
So what happened if Paris, you look at Notre Dame, how many people in here have been to Notre Dame? It's gorgeous, the Gothic cathedral built in almost 200 years it took to build that, and then many more project, projects of restoration. Can you imagine just one building being destroyed? That would have, you know, that would have taken, they would, they would not have been able to rebuild that. That was people's entire lives, maybe a family of masons and uh, generations of work to put this thing together. And Paris would have been razed to the ground. The German Army Corps of Engineers in two weeks planted mines, torpedoes, which are gigantic, uh, and bombs in all of the bridges, many of the churches, all of the utilities, the water systems, uh, the chapels, the palaces, and uh, all, all the buildings that they could do in two weeks. And then they had 200 Luftwaffe planes and more artillery. They could have raised Paris to the ground and created a royal uh, cataclysmic mess. Instead, this is what we have today thanks to the liberation of Paris in gratitude for all the people who participated in that. And the Pont Neuf, I happen to have the blessing to live right across the street on the Rive Gauche. I, didn't, I never took this bridge for granted. I lived there, and you know how work can become repetitive. You get up early, I get up early, made my, my food, got ready for work. You know, they call it in French, metro, boulot, dodo. The metro in the morning, boulot, going to sleep in the evening. Uh, I'm sorry, boulot, the work, and then dodo is the sleep. And that's what I lived, you know, the repetitive work life. But my, one of my bus stops, that I took every morning was actually on the Pont Neuf, and I never took this bridge for granted. It's just exquisite. Look how long it, it took to build that lovely bridge, the oldest bridge in Paris. So von Schultzitz and many generals and other officers in this nasty war had the Sippenhaft Law, which is, again, Middle Ages type of policy handed down from Hitler, which said that if you didn't follow the rules, what are we going to do? You're all the way over in Paris. We're going to take the SS and the Gestapo, and they're going to come by and they're going to arrest your family, your next of kin. Horrible circumstance. So von Schultz has had the letter demanding Paris was to be defended to the last man with all the resources in the event of a, a withdrawal. And if you didn't do that, it's curtains for your family and then eventually you. In less than two weeks, we talked about that. Does anybody know this opening quote from a famous book from 1953? He participated for many years in the Santa Barbara Writers' Conference. He passed away. Ray Bad Radbury, Fahrenheit 451. And that's what would have happened. And imagine the, you know, these Germans that were destroying towns. I mean, I don't know what else you could think, because it wasn't militaristic to destroy Rotterdam. It's just watching things burn in devastation. So we're going to look at von Schultzitz ignores the letter. Here he is, a person who is a noble who grew up around war. He, his family was from many generations of noble officers. And he did not destroy Paris. He did not follow orders. And he surrendered to the French resistance under Colonel Roll Tanguy, who was a communist, and to the uh, free French forces, the military, uh, and many of the people who participated in the war. Some were even Spanish people who were came in to Paris to liberate them. So here's the timeline with the clock ticking. August 7th, a major counterattack towards Arvanche, Western Normandy. The 15th is Operation Dragoon in the south of France. Resistance uprisings in Paris. And without those resistance uprisings, it's very likely that Paris could have been destroyed. But the resistance uprisings happened. They were ill-equipped. They didn't have food. They were starving. But they started the uprising. And eventually, de Gaulle and Leclerc were able to convince Eisenhower and company that we got to go in and liberate Paris, otherwise the city is going to be destroyed and hundreds of thousands of lives of the Parisians will be lost. So began the street fighting. Let's take a look at that. German V1 rockets attacking on Britain. The clock is ticking. The Allies continue to win battles all throughout France, but it's pas toujours facile, not always easy. The hedgerow battles you may have heard about. The Soviets captured Minsk and Belarus, so they're moving in from the Eastern Front. Then there's the assassination attempt. Many of you have probably seen the movies about Operation Valkyrie, the attempt to seize power and appoint new leaders and make peace with the Allies. Then the Soviets on July 24th liberate the first concentration camp in Poland. 
Poor Anne Frank and her family are arrested on August 4th by the Gestapo in Amsterdam. And right after uh, Otto Frank, her father, was arrested, he said he needed to get one thing, his, his um, ID, out of his chest. And under the bed, he pulls out his chest while these SF, SS officers are watching him and have him on guard. And he pulls it out, and it's none other than the World War I chest. Otto Frank, Anne's father, served in World War I but everyone else already saw that he was to be arrested and this one last SS officer who was in charge of arresting Otto Frank said, if you'd only told us in the beginning that you served in World War I, we would have let you go. I mean, just the amount of drama, the amount of drama in World War II, it's just incredible. So on August 7th, von Schultz becomes the military governor of Paris. He arrived by train on August 9th. He had just said goodbye to his family. He had two daughters, a wife, and a young son. He knows about this blood guilt law, the Sippenhof law, and he's charged with occupying Paris and running the show. Eventually, the Par Parisians won't stand for it, and women like this, with a German helmet on, they go out and they build 400 barricades, sandbags. They even made one out of a pissoir. Does anyone ever know what a pissoir is? The gigantic urinals, if you remember Paris back in, even in the up to the 80s, they had these gigantic urinals and they could withstand machine gun fire <laughs> made out of iron and ceramic and, you know, again, French efficacy building these, these urinals. And they, they did whatever they could and they were instrumental in, in, in stopping the German uh, effort to escape and to uh, wage battle. The timeline still. The Allies encircled the Germans, thanks to Patton running ahead a little bit. Didn't always follow the protocol, but he always seemed to do well and, and get, him, get himself where he needed to be. And his troops followed him out of respect. He said, they don't love me, but they respect me. And the Battle of Normandy, Overlord, is still continuing. August 25th, the liberation of Paris, before those horrible mines were detonated. Von Schultes surrenders, free French, and the head of the FFI, Colonel Roll, who lived to, into his 90s. He's an interesting character. You can read up on him. Wish I could have met him when I was over. I've been there so many times, but uh, I wasn't uh, connecting with as many people that were higher ups back in those days, but that would have been fun. So after the liberation of Paris, you had these men who had been waging in these horrible battles, you know, maybe having machine gun and artillery fire at them within the few hours before this lovely kiss. And what did these people need? Well, these people took them home, gave them a meal, a shower, and maybe some TLC, which is what they needed because they were stuck in these encampments in England for months. And that's what happened before they were sent back where the next day? Back to this. So you go from the goodbye kiss to this, which means you and your four compatriots in here are probably no longer, because when a tank gets hit, especially the non-diesel tanks, the American had the gasoline tanks, they'd go up in flames and you would become history very quickly. Horrible battles in the fellow's pocket, not far from Paris. And then, because you had to seize power, de Gaulle's waited from 1940 until now, he flies in from Algiers to Normandy on a plane that was running out of gas, flying on fumes, as they say, and the pilot said, we have to turn back, we can't make it. And what did de Gaulle say? Six foot four, fight or flight himself at this time. He says, no, you're going to land this plane. And they, they made it. Another miracle is they, land, they were able to land the plane. He got in his cars with his aides, and they made it all the way to Paris. And here he is with some of his adversaries with snipers, les tireurs, les tireurs isolés, still in some of the windows not far away, taking pot shots at the people in the parade. But he says, this is going to be a parade, and I want to show the Parisians you're liberated. I also want to show them that I am going to be in charge for a little while, not the communists. And so that's what he did, and he took charge. So now we have General von Schultz's. What does history do with these people? Well, the French people certainly don't have a statue of General von Schultzitz. Here we are coming to the end. What should they do? Commemorating the savior of Paris? I mean, I think you have to honor von Schultzitz in a way, no matter if you like the Nazis or not. He's a soldier doing what he was supposed to do, which is fight in the, the battles and follow the orders. 
and he did not destroy Paris. So that was <clears throat> an incredible feat. The reasons he gave many years later while they were writing this book was that he saw no military purpose in it. Paris was a beautiful city, you know, and here he is already having destroyed many other cities, Sebastopol, Sebastopol Rotterdam, etc. And now he gets to Paris and he's convinced by several people, including the Swedish consul and some of the uh, higher ups in Paris, and he decides not to destroy it. The main reason, he says, is because he met with Hitler before he left and where he was giving his direct orders, and he said, I realized that Hitler was a changed man from the other time I saw him back in the early 40s when Germany was doing more well. He sat across from him at dinner, and he said, I would realized that Hitler had gone insane. So that's the main reason that he, he didn't follow that order. So here's General von Schultz, as you can tell, tell uh, your people who follow history what you think of him, but I, I think he deserves some recognition. So how many people in here who have kids or family members who are couch potatoes, desk potatoes, or car potatoes? Raise your hand. <laughs> so if you're sedentary, you're working on a laptop, do it standing up as much as possible. I like being standing up. I teach people how to live more like a hunter-gatherer, more like Jack LaLanne in the sedentary world despite the laptops, despite all of the emails and texts that we have every day. So if you'd like to learn more about that and help support the community events, I have some books and a lovely friend Chloe is out there and she will greet you and there's some books and DVDs and I swear by them. I've been doing fitness since I was six years old. I learned from Jack LaLanne whose parents were from what country? Lalonde? And he speaks French, yes, Jacques Lalonde. And I've been learning from him and many more people. And that's what I do. Does it help your brain exercise? Yes. Neurological activity, brain, brain, blood flow, oxygenating the brain. Keep moving. Even though as we age, we have less physical activity for many people, keep moving, stand as much as possible, and do simple stretches. Does this look hard? but I'm taking my back and I'm extending my spine. And those are some simple things that I teach people how to do. And we're so busy being productive in the modern world, we don't stop to take care of ourselves. And if we can't take care of ourselves, whom can we take care of? We collapse and we need everyone's help, right? So these military people were fit at 20. I would like to see them fit at 80 and 90 and beyond. So we will end this with a little bit of music, but I would love for you to all say, Da 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 da. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. <laughs> We're going to have a little bit of music and then some questions and some Q&A. So we'll enjoy the music. Allez chanter Miller. <laughs> Merci, Edith. Merci beaucoup. Okay, my activities of starting fitness at six years old. So I, I jokingly tell people because when I was in high school and I was growing from sophomore year to junior year and becoming 175, I said, boy, I'm going to keep going and wind up being a linebacker because I work out all the time. Well, guess what? I stopped. And I have the same body I did when I was 18. So <clears throat> despite all of the hard work, so I jokingly tell people, because I've worked so much on fitness, I've been a commitment, for, uh, mind, body, and spirit for my entire life, 
I jokingly tell people, because I did many years of uh, martial arts as well, that I'm Jacqueline mixed with Bruce Lee trapped inside the body of Gilligan. <laughs> but I never, I never let the body stop me. So what if you don't have the big, strong linebacker body? What can you do? What compensates for that? The mind does. Jimmy Connors in tennis, not a big, strong player. What did he do? He has the strongest mind of anyone I've ever witnessed. I happened to work at the French Open in 79 and 81. I got to meet Connors. I saw him at Costco about three months ago. And with Patty, who was very, very nice to me also. But you overcome things with your mind. So as the body goes, the mind follows. As the mind goes, the body follows. So I say, make that commitment every day. And I do it early morning so that at the end of the day, I can't use fatigue as an excuse. I, I'm up at four. I do the exercise from five to seven. It's not all hard. There's a lot of taking things from other things like yoga, pilates, martial arts, jack-o'-lane calisthenics, and playful movement. So I bring that all together. And that's, that's really, I think, what keeps me, even though the rat race can be challenging, that keeps me happy and, and 18 forever. Yeah, not, not counting what we did in Dresden. So um, the woman in the back mentioned that there is sound military reason for destroying cities. So I'm going to remind people, if they haven't seen The Fog of War, with um, McNamara, Robert S. McNamara. He's 83 in this documentary. It's not on YouTube, but the, uh, the, uh, the shorter version, the lead-in, uh, is on YouTube. But I encourage you to watch The Fog of War. Robert McNamara, in this documentary, it's just an interview of him with outtakes to uh, footage of his life. And so he has a mind in his 80s that remembered things from when he was five years old all the way until he's in his 80s. And he's got an incredible mind. And he talks that about before the bombs of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, all of the different cities and what the devastation was from the uh, incendiary bombs that were unleashed by the Americans. Curtis LeMay, his boss, called him Bomber LeMay. He was the right-hand man of Curtis LeMay, and he names all the cities. He names which cities in America had the similar uh, size of, of citizens and the devastation. He'll say, uh, Yokohama, uh, similar, similar to Topeka, 60% of the city destroyed. And so, yes, you have a valid point. There, there was, in his opinion, in Curtis LeMay's opinion, a valid reason for destroying cities when someone's not surrendering, right? So that was a good point. Any, any questions from back here? Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Greg. And thank you, staff of the Maritime Museum. Thank you, attendees.